That includes Seven as a professor at Ohio State University, where he wrote dozens of peer reviewed articles. In his free time, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked Dr. Gleb to share with us specifically about managing the risk of returning uh, to the office in, amid the Delta surge. So without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Gleb. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate it. Well, everyone, let's talk about how you can address the Delta surge as IT and audit professionals. This is a serious issue and you've seen a number of companies changing their plans. Now, let's talk a little bit about returning to the office as a whole and then in the context of that, the Delta surge. So that's gonna be the first part of the presentation, kind of dangerous judgment errors we all make because of how our brains are wired in returning to the office in general, managing post pandemic norms, what's going on there. Of course, we're not out of the pandemic, but preparing for the post pandemic world, at least post vaccine world, COVID will still be around for a long time. Hopefully it will not be a pandemic for too much longer. You know, you might have seen the news that the administration has just approved, the presidential administration has just approved booster shots for all Americans eight months after the vaccine. So hopefully that will be helpful, but we'll see what's going on. And of course, hopefully more people will get vaccines. Always props to that. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the situation. Now, you probably heard leaders say something in the following style, that leader people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. You've probably heard that a lot. That's very common. That's something that's really important that, you, that leaders are saying right now. And it's true right now that differentiating competitive advantage for any company is its people, especially in terms of the great resignation where so many people are leaving their jobs right now, looking for better ones. That is something to recognize that's happening. Unfortunately, many leaders, very many leaders are failing to live by that principle. They're really comfortable with in-office culture and that makes it a problem for returning to the office effectively because returning to the office effectively with the previous modality, turning back the clock causes a lot of problems for companies and causes them to lose the competitive advantage by losing their people. Both people who resign and people who are disengaged have low morale because they do not want to go back to January 2020. They realize that turning back the clock is something that is not really workable. So I want to hear from you whether you've observed this, not necessarily in your company, but just somewhere around you, maybe in your competitors, maybe in your vendors. Did you ever observe leaders trying to turn back the clock to January 2020? You'll be able to see a poll right now in Zoom. So please go ahead and answer that poll. You'll be able to click yes or no. So did you observe leaders trying to turn back the clock? See about two thirds of you voted. Good, I'll give you five more seconds for those who didn't vote yet or didn't figure out how to vote yet. Five more seconds. All right, we'll see that this is definitely an experience that a large majority, two thirds of you have seen. You've observed leaders trying to turn back the clock. So that's good to know. You've observed that in your own environment, whether in your company, whether in your suppliers, your competitors, all of those sorts of things, you've seen that happening. And that's definitely a problem right now. Many companies, unfortunately, many leaders are making these sorts of mistakes where they're trying to turn back the clock not a really good idea from looking at the best practices for the future of work. Now, unfortunately for these leaders who are trying to turn back the clock and return to full-time office work, returning to full-time office work has a lot of problems. It's really bad for a whole range of issues. Retention, because lots of people are leaving. Recruitment, many people are not going to companies that want to turn back the clock, especially in areas like IT and auditing where many of these activities can be done from home full-time remotely. Of course, some would should be done in the office, but that only requires a hybrid schedule, not full-time in office work. 
morale. People have really low morale in companies that are trying to return to work full time. Productivity, we know from research that productivity is actually higher from people who are full time at home on average. On average, people experience a 10 to 14% increase in their productivity from being full time at home rather than returning full to returning to the office full time and hybrid is kind of in the middle, so to speak. But full-time at home is 10 to 14% increase in productivity. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but just so you know, there's definitely a bad hit to productivity for people returning to the office. Work-life balance. The statistics research overwhelmingly shows that people have better work-life balance if they have an opportunity to work substantial amount of time remotely. Mental health and well-being, same thing. That's definitely improved by working a lot of your time, not necessarily full-time, but a substantial proportion of your time remotely. And finally, your bottom line. The bottom line of companies, of course, is dangerously hurt if they have serious issues in the retention, recruitment, employee morale, productivity, employee work-life balance, and employee mental health and well-being. Now, Let's talk about what employees actually want. And this, I want to tell you, is coming from surveys that, came, that happened before the Delta surge. So the Delta surge will exacerbate these results because people are more worried about returning to the office now than the Delta surge. But this is eight major independent surveys that were done before the Delta surge. And after the Delta surge, again, they're more exacerbated. But here's the, here are the results. And this is organizations like the Harvard Business School, like the Society for Human Resource Management, so major independent organizations, as well as large companies like Microsoft, which has internal data. It didn't only do surveys of employees, not its employees, of all employees. It also used internal company data from Microsoft Teams and from LinkedIn to help in these survey results. It, all of these surveys, on average, find that over 85% of workers over 85% want substantial remote work. That's over half the time they want to do their work remotely. They do not want to go back to the office. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. So large, large proportion, a large minority. In some companies, I, I consulted for by now 16 companies on returning to the office. And in some of these companies, as many as 80% of their employees who are previously full-time in the office wanted full-time remote work. In some companies, less employees want full-time remote work. So right now I'm working with a large company, 20,000 people. It's a manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing, works for the semiconductor industry. So equipment for the semiconductor industry, their internal polling that shows that 12% want full-time remote work of their employees. So it ranges. So sometimes there'll be 12%, sometimes there'll be 83%, I think, in that company. The other company that I mentioned, uh, that was a research, clinical research company. So it'll range, but the, all the external surveys, large surveys show that 25 to 35% of employees want full-time remote work. And of course, this is only people who are able to work remotely. 40% to 55% in various surveys would leave their jobs if forced to come in full-time. And we've already been seeing this happening in a number of places, in a number of companies, that people have been leaving these companies because they're being forced to come in full-time. So you're in the IT and auditing, you probably have seen that Google was trying to force its employees to come back to the office for a long time, saying, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll come back, we'll come back. And they, from my internal source of Google, they had internal employee turnover, serious resistance. And finally, on May 5th, they announced that, hey, we'll allow up to 20% of our remote of our workforce to work full-time remotely, and another 20% to work from any office they want. They don't have to go back to their original office. Amazon, same situation. They actually wanted everyone to go, not even hybrid, everyone full-time work. And they announced in June 10th that they'll allow people to work substantial remote time. Uber, same thing. And then Apple, we're seeing making some pretty some similar situation where employees are internally rebelling against the, the Apple's desire for them to go back to for everyone to go back to the office. And so we are seeing these trillion dollar companies, Apple, Google, Amazon, the leaders making really bad decisions. 
And we already saw Google and Amazon deciding that they really screwed up and they have spent, have wasted billions of dollars on the return to work plans that caused a number of top employees to leave, serious hits to morale, and of course, had to change their plans. So it cost them many billions of dollars to make bad decisions in that area. Apple is really hurting right now. Uber, of course, also. 70% of employees say they're less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. Now, another issue that is really important to realize is the important aspect of virtual work for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We know that when you're looking at knowledge workers, so surveys of knowledge workers, 20% of white knowledge workers want full-time in-office work. So that's definitely within the range. So we see that generally 15 to 25% of people in surveys want full-time in-office work. So something like that, 10% in some surveys, 15, 20 want full-time in-office work. So of white knowledge, of knowledge workers, 20% of those who are white want full-time in-office work. What about those who are not white? Let's say African-Americans, so black knowledge workers. How many of them want? want full-time remote work? Only 3%. 3%. Why is that, do you think? Well, it's because of discrimination. They face microaggressions. They face bias every day in their in-office work. And they find that virtual work, substantial or especially full-time virtual work, protects them from this. They don't face that same sort of microaggression. They don't face the same sort of bias in their interactions virtually. So this has similar findings for other minority groups, especially helpful for people who are physically disabled to not have to go to the office of uh, has a lot of problems for them, but also all sorts of diversity inclusion issues. So a uh, diversity equity inclusion is definitely helped by uh, virtual work. Now, oh, I mentioned about well-being. Let's look at surveys. So substantial work from home after COVID would make 75% of surveys takers happier. So over 75%, over 70% less stressed, 75% better able to manage work-life balance. So really good for work-life balance. It's also productivity. It also helps them in that. I mentioned the data on 10 to 14% increase in productivity. That's because employees work an average over 20 hours more per month, which makes sense because, you know, you go to the office, you know, an hour commute there, an hour commute back, and that includes... Uh, getting up, getting dressed, and you know, shaving and so on, and then getting to the office, passing through security. So not only the driving time, but all the so all the preparation, and the on the spot getting settled into your new into your workplace, all that stuff, and then going back, all that same. So that's a lot of time wasted for every person that goes to the office every day. That's two, you know, now we're there, now we're back. That's ten hours a week. So employees have worked quite a bit more when they during lockdowns, over 20 hours more per month. And that, of course, makes a lot of sense. 75% report higher or equal productivity in working from home. And employees would be willing to take an 8% pay cut, an average of 8% pay cut for substantial remote work. Many, of course, would be willing to take a higher pay cut. I'm not suggesting you cut employee pay, but that's indicative of how much employees value work from home. Now, there are some challenges with remote work. 50% of employees feel overworked. 55% of experience burnout. 80%, over 80% want less meetings. The biggest issues they find is that over 60% report poor virtual communication skills are a serious issue. And over 55% report the technology issues are definitely a serious issue. So that's what the surveys are showing on remote work. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. So again, we'll have the polling. I'm going to check on your preferred working style. What would you prefer after the pandemic has passed? So maybe COVID is still kind of around, but the pandemic has passed. We're not in any sort of threat of the pandemic anymore. So fully remote, you come in once a quarter for team building, one to three days in the office, the rest at home, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, full-time five days in the office. Let's give you five more seconds. Okay. 
All right, so we see that, yeah, so this group, the, the audience over here is definitely more interested in remote than average. So that's something to note. About half of you would want full-time remote. Only, what is it, 3% of you would want five days full-time in the office and four days in the office, same thing. So then something like 45% of you would want one to two to three days in the office. And the large, the half of you would want full-time remote. So that's good to know and good to know where you're coming from and seeing that definitely on average, IT and audit professionals have more of a desire for full for remote work, whether full-time remote work or mostly hybrid. So in the meantime, Miguel asks, about the older management teams and we'll talk about their errors that they're making in trying to rush everyone back to the office you can see in the chat and i will definitely share the studies so that we'll, we, you'll be able to vote for the resources that you want and i'll be happy to share the studies there's a book i wrote on this topic called returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams which has links to all the studies all the information that's shared here and we'll talk about and I've been working a lot with management and I'll talk about what needs to be done. And the first thing that needs to be done for management to address these issues is to point out why they're making these errors and trying to get their offices filled up again, especially in the, case, in the context of COVID, but more generally as well. And that's because of these mental blind spots called cognitive biases. These are dangerous judgments we all make because of how our brains are wired. So this is something that the leaders management is making serious mistakes because of these dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases that result from our evolutionary background. So we, our brains are actually, from the recent research on this topic, they're not evolved for the modern environment. They're evolved for the savanna environment when we lived in small tribes of 50 to 150 people. We had to deal with the fight with saber-toothed tigers to jump at 100 shadows to get away from the one saber-toothed tiger. And that's called the saber-toothed tiger response, also called the fight or flight response. That's what we're wired for. So we're making systematic mistakes because of our wiring, because of our biology. That is not fit for the modern world. And so managers are making, having certain feelings. Their gut is telling them that certain activities are the right things to do, and they are making mistakes because of that. One of the biggest problems that I'm seeing managers making big mistakes around is called the status quo bias. So the status quo bias, it's a desire to get back to the status quo or maintain a status quo that feels right, that feels intuitive, that feels correct. Now, these managers, they've been in the leadership positions for, for over a decade. They've succeeded because of in-person activities. So they feel that they want to get back to a place that they're successful. They want to get back to in-person because they feel that's right. That's the status quo that feels good to them. And they are blind to the major disruption from the pandemic where the large majority, where you, you can see from the, from the results yourself that for IT and audit professionals, you know, you're not any different. When I do Isaka talks on this, about half of the group, something like that, 40 to 50-ish percent want full-time remote. Now, managers, many fewer of them want full-time remote, many fewer of them just want hybrid. And you can see that only 3% of you wanted full-time back in the office, and only 3% of you wanted four days, whereas hybrid is usually kind of half the time, one to three days in the office. I recommend generally one day, but we can talk about that later. But this is a serious, serious problem for managers. They feel successful in that environment. They feel they can have accountability. They can see everyone, they can engage with them, and that they can make sure that people are working, which is, of course, silly when you look at productivity ratings. I mean, in the large majority of companies have found, indeed, that their workers are more productive from home, but managers want that oversight. They want that status quo. That's what they feel comfortable with. Another big problem is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect. What's that about? Well, you've seen that Amazon changed its perspective. You've seen that Google has changed its perspective. You've seen that Uber has changed its perspective. Clearly, they made the wrong decisions in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to spend billions of dollars 
on the wrong plans and returning to the office and then having to change those plans. I mean, if, how much does real estate cost? It's billions of dollars. And they, of course, lost many, many top workers and that cost them many billions. The false consensus effect is where we feel that other people who are part of our in-group, who are part of our tribe, should share our beliefs. And we ignore information that they don't. So we, it's an incorrect belief that others in our tribe, in our in-group, share our preferences, and such as coming to the office. And so I've seen large companies ignore the results of their internal surveys. Of course, they ignore external surveys, but even internal surveys they ignore. They, I've seen many companies, so I did a, I work with a peer executive group that has many, many thousands of leaders of middle market companies ranging from 100 to 2,500 people in the company. And so they did a survey as part of their work with me on how many middle market companies who are part of their, who are part of the peer executive groups for this large organization, how many of them surveyed their employees on what their employees want to do in returning to the office. You know what? Only 44% of them did surveys. Only 44% of them substantially anonymously asked their employees on what they want in returning to the office. That's obviously a terrible idea, unfortunately, but that's exactly what happens. And so many companies are making the same serious mistake. And so this is the false consensus effect. Now, you can understand why that happened from the tribalism perspective for, for how our mind is wired, but that's a big problem. Similarly, the status quo bias also goes back to the Savannah environment. In the Savannah environment, it was very important to get back to the status quo whenever there was a shift from the status quo because it was a very much, it was a very harsh environment. So any shift from the status quo was likely to be pretty bad. So leaders wanted to get back to the status quo and it's an intuition for us to get back to the status quo, but that's a serious mistake. We're not in the Savannah environment anymore. Another problem is called the confirmation bias. If you've heard of any cognitive biases, you've probably heard of this one, where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. For example, the way that when I've worked with companies and that haven't done surveys, what they did in, in terms of trying to get information on what employees want and getting back to the office is that the CEO talked to the C-suite, the C-suite talked to the S senior VPs, and that's all. <laughs> they just talked to each other and they said, yes, you know, we all want to go back to the office, therefore our employees should want to go back to the office, therefore we'll go back to the office. That's kind of how the conversations went. And they didn't think about the fact that you're looking at exactly the same sort of people, people who are successful for a decade, two decades, three decades in their work by being in the office and surrounded by others. They feel gregarious, they're social, they're extroverted. They want that. They want those people, you, around them. And they're not realizing the kind of dangerous judgment errors they're making because of it. Another problem specifically relevant to the, the delta surge, especially relevant to the delta surge, is the normalcy bias. The normalcy bias. We greatly underestimate major disruptions, their likelihood and their impact. We want things to go back to normal. And so vaccines have been perceived by many people as being kind of the marker of everything is going back to normal. I mean, they have most people have vaccines now. Everyone who wants to has a vaccine. Therefore, things are back to normal. And there's no possibility of any sort of major disruptors associated with the pandemic. Therefore, we should all go back to the office. They're greatly underestimating the threat of new variants, which was very clear that this new variants of Delta surge is a serious issue. And they underestimated that long tail risk, the serious possibility of major disruptors that are not super intuitively immediately likely, but quite, quite realistic. And the Delta variant is one of these. So Pfizer effectiveness versus Delta. Let's talk about Delta. So Pfizer effectiveness versus Delta is unfortunately based on extensive data from Israel down to 39% after six months. Now, why Israel? Well, Israel is the country that first vaccinated its population with Pfizer. And that was in January, December, January, February, extensive vaccination. And so they're finding that their vaccine efficacy against Delta of Pfizer after six months this is down to 39%. That's why the Biden administration, because of Israeli data and because of other data, that's why the Biden administration has decided that they'll give booster shots after eight months to everyone, not simply 
immunocompromised people, not simply older people, because the vaccine effectiveness is down. That's a big problem. We also know that new variants are coming. You know, you've heard of the Delta, right? That's the big one. Delta Plus is another issue. So it's a variant that's just like Delta, just as infectious, but has an extra mutation that appears to allow it to escape our vaccines more effectively. So unfortunately, our vaccines are going to be even less effective against Delta Plus. That's more resistant to vaccines and it's already spreading in the Bay Area and has been found in 11 countries, as well as other areas as well. So in the US, it's not only in the Bay Area, but it's definitely quite extensive in the Bay Area, spreading elsewhere as well. And we have to realize that such variants will continue to face them. Delta, Delta Plus, you've heard of others. There are plenty of Greek letters in the alphabet, unfortunately. And so we'll face them going forward. So we need to understand that we'll be facing waves of vaccines, waves of variants going forward. It won't be a simple, you know, Delta Plus peaks in the October, November, which is the, what the model suggests it's going to peak at, and then everything will be fine. No, we'll have other variants coming down the road. So this is, is a serious problem for companies that aren't prepared. You want to understand that for the sake of risk management and company culture, you want to have some people virtual all the time, at all times. So you want some people who will be always virtual and so that you have a company culture that accepts virtual activities as just a part of their culture, as part of the company culture. And so that all people are able to go virtual on short notice. That's really important. Finally, a final mental blind spot, a final cognitive bias is called functional fixedness. We perceive only one right way to function. That's just the way that our mind is. You've probably heard of the hammer nail syndrome. When, every, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we perceive only one right way to function. For example, for the way that we collaborate together, people tend to transpose in-office culture on remote work. And that's a bad idea. They fail to adapt strategically to remote work. We'll talk about how to do so in the next part of the presentation. But before we get to that, I want to have another poll and ask you, which of these problematic cognitive biases do you see as the biggest problem for returning to work in your workplace? So please go ahead and vote on that. Give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. All right. So we can see that the biggest problem is the normalcy bias. One third of you identify the normalcy bias. So with the Delta variant with leaders not recognizing, hey, Delta variant is going to be big and there will be other variants going forward. This is a big problem, followed closely by the status quo bias, where the leaders are kind of stuck to their existing ways and not acknowledging the major disruption from the pandemic. And the next one is the false consensus effect, where leaders tend to believe falsely that their people in their companies, their employees have the same beliefs that they do, as well as others. So functional fixedness is the next one, and we'll talk about how to address functional fixedness and these other cognitive biases, but especially functional fixedness. So the competitive advantage in the future of work is going to be a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote. That's what the research shows is the best model for the large majority of companies. So where the minority of your employees, 10 to 30% will be fully remote and a majority, 70 to 90% will be hybrid, one to three days in the office. The amount of in-office work for the hybrid people, for the people who are hybrid, should depend on collaboration, how much collaboration you have to do. You want to justify any amount of time over one day a week in the office. And that's a really important way of addressing cognitive biases. So when you're talking to the team leaders, team leaders are the ones who should decide. You shouldn't have the top tell you, okay, everyone does you know, one day a week or two days a week. You should give guidance. The top leadership, the C-suite should say, should give the people supervisors the ability, the kind of the ones who are the supervisors of rank and file, the ability to make their own decisions. So the flexibility of making their own decisions. And they should say, okay, 
here's the guidance. We'll have want the minority fully remote, the majority one to three days in the office. And you want one day in the office is kind of like a basic for people who are working hybrid to maintain team com, culture, collaboration, organizational connection. Any time over one day in the office should be justified by additional collaborative activities you have to do. Because the only things you'll be doing in the office is collaborative activities. Your individual work is quite a bit better done at home. So the large majority of research, large majority of, is, is the large majority of your of people's work is individual work for the most people. And individual work is overwhelmingly, for the large majority of people, much better done at home. People are much more productive on their individual work at home. For a collaborative work, it depends the kind of collaborative work, the intensity of it, the kind of personalities involved. So there's, you know, some is some is more effective at home, some is more effective in the office, but you want to do some in the office to maintain the team culture for people who do have that hybrid schedule. Now, who is going to work full-time remote? Teams, whole teams that decide to be full-time remote, that's great. For individuals and hybrid teams who decide to be full-time remote, these are people who can be effective while working full-time remotely. So people who are disciplined, people who take initiative, people who are able to advocate for their needs being met, and who are made aware of any potential career growth issues. Because there are some issues where the research shows that people do have career growth issues when they are the remote people on otherwise hybrid teams. So you want to be aware of that and be able to advocate for your career if you do decide to be full-time remote on a hybrid teams. In any case, there should be team building retreats for fully remote teams once per quarter to improve social bonding, improve trust, team collaboration, company culture connection, and plan your team strategy. Now, one of the things that's important for effective, so addressing functional fixedness, making sure you don't transpose your in-office culture on this new hybrid slash remote working style with hybrid first model with some minority fully remote is to reshape your office space. So you want to get information from your team leaders on your plans for in-office work. So this is, I'm talking about the, the top leadership should get information. And then you want to decrease your real estate footprint and office services accordingly. So if you have, let's say, some people working full-time remotely, most people coming in one day a week, some people coming in two or three days a week, let's say an average you have people coming in one day a week, right? So your office occupancy compared to your 100% occupancy previously is going to go down to 20%, an average of today of one day a week for your whole workforce. Now you'll need some basic office space for things like payroll accounting, for team, for leadership offices, for things like meeting rooms, conference rooms, for training and so on. The rest is depends on occupancy. So you want to reduce most of your office space. If you have people coming in one day on average, you can probably get rid of 50% or more of your office space. And then you want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative. So right now, the typical office space setup is 20% collaborative and 80% private individual. This should really shift. This should be something like one third private and two thirds collaborative because the vast majority of work that people will be doing is collaboration. They won't be coming in, the vast majority of employees won't be coming in to do their individual work in the office. And if they want to do their individual work in the office, they can just you know, hot desk, there can be floating desks this assigned to teams slash anyone who wants to take them. So there, there are various arrangements we can talk about. But that's what you want to do. You want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative, meaning conference rooms with really good video conference software. So you can have effective meetings, hybrid meetings. And that's something that you want to focus on. And as part of that, you'll want, so you'll have a lot of savings from your real estate, cutting the real estate footprint and office-based services. You'll want to devote some of that to funding for home offices. Remember, the home office of your employees will be now part of your company office. So you'll want to fund them. You'll want to make it comfortable for them. You'll want to make them as productive as possible. It's in your interest to do so. Internet connection. You want to make sure they don't use basic broadband. Of course, you want to make sure they have broadband. You want to make sure they have the upgraded broadband. Have them have good equipment, not simply laptops, but have them have good video cameras, good microphones, good lighting. You know they are not bothered by having bad video cameras and bad lighting and bad microphones. Their teammates are bothered by it and the external stakeholders who they're communicating with are bothered by it. 
you don't want that. You want to give them good equipment. Ergonomic furniture, so they're comfortable, so they don't hurt themselves working in the home office. Soundproofing, so they're not distracted. Room separators, if they don't have a separate office, and so on. The funding the, for that depend, is dependent on the cost of living in the area, but somewhere from two to 3,000 is per year is the typical funding for home offices, plus an additional 500 for working parents. Now on that topic, I'm curious if you think you'll benefit from funding for home offices. Do you think you, you or members of your team would benefit from this funding? Please go ahead, vote on that. So I see that most of you participated. Let's give you five more seconds. Great, so we see that over 90% of you would benefit. That's probably the folks who want to do either full-time remote or the ones who want to do most of your time for the most of the time hybrid. So, or want to do hybrid with most of your time remote. Great, and the rest of the people who want to go to the office for five to four days a week probably would not benefit so much. Now, you want to revise your performance evaluation. That's part of adapting to the new normal. You don't want to simply stick to the old performance evaluation, which is based essentially on people, on your boss seeing you work and kind of evaluating you work from how much time you are in the office. So from time spent working, you don't want that to be the evaluation basis. You want to look at employee productivity, meaning your accomplishments, your deliverables. What did you actually do? What are your tasks that you succeeded in? And don't have that one per year evaluation. Have of many evaluations and evaluating both individual tasks and collaborative tasks. Now, that one individual evaluation per year, the annual evaluation or quarterly is not a good idea. So you want to move from that to weekly report evaluations and check-in meetings. That is something that you'll do for task-based accomplishments. So you'll, as a team member, you'll submit to your team leader a brief report, a paragraph with what you accomplished for the week, your top three to five accomplishments, any challenges you faced, how you solved those challenges, your plans for accomplishments for, for next week and a self-evaluation. The team leader will have a meeting with you for 15 to 30 minutes per week to respond to the accomplishments, maybe give you some coaching on how to solve these problems better and either agree or revise your accomplishment plans for next week. And finally, either agree or revise with your self-evaluation for performance. And that performance evaluation gets fed into a continual process of performance evaluation. That's a much better fit for this new hybrid slash remote model, hybrid and remote model rather than this typical quarterly or annual performance evaluation. I want to check on your thoughts with this performance evaluation. Do you think that would be helpful for you? Please go ahead and vote. Give me five more seconds. Okay, so we see that over 80% of you would definitely find it helpful. So that's an important thing to th think about and bring up to your leadership about changing your performance evaluation. Next, adapting your culture. So you want to replace office-style bonding. Zoom happy hours do not work well. Please don't do that. That is not a good way of bonding with each other. You want to have native virtual formats. For example, a text-based morning update where let's say you're using Microsoft Teams or Slack or something like that, Trello. But let's say Microsoft Teams. You have a, on each of those sorts of things, you can have a channel or a card devoted to each team for private conversations. And that card or the channel each morning each team member shares how they're feeling, how they're doing, 
what they plan to focus on that day, how their private life is going, and any fun facts about themselves that their team members might not know. And so that can be a daily, uh, fun facts about themselves or about the world that team members might not know. So that can be a daily activity. That should be a daily activity that you do when you check into the morning and then you respond to three other people who shared their morning update. That's a way of keeping human to each other and a way of replacing the office cooler conversations, much more effective than Zoom happy hours or something like that. Then you want to have virtual collaboration for digital co-working. That's where everyone signs on to a video conference meeting every day that for hybrid teams, for remote teams, by the way, the office style bonding that's for hybrid teams for the day that they're not coming to the office as well as remote workers who are working full time. Same thing for digital co-working. When you're not coming into the office, what you do is you have an hour long period or two hours, depending on what you prefer as a team, where you have a video conference meeting. You sign into a video conference meeting and you all share what you plan to work on during that hour just your individual tasks. You're not collaborating with anyone. So your individual tasks. Then you turn your microphones off. You keep your speakers on and your camera is optional. And then if you have questions, you can turn your, your microphone on and ask questions. So most folks who in companies who I helped adapt this strategy save their more intense tasks for this period that are either harder to do and they want some motivation from working with a collaborator, with team members, or they have, might have questions about. So this is a very, very useful strategy for team collaboration. Virtual mentorship, that's another very important strategy where you want to have somebody from your own team as a mentor for people who are junior, and you want to have people, uh, two mentors from outside your team, one from the same business unit, one from a different business unit. Why you, do you want to have people from outside the team? Well, for hybrid and remote workers, a challenge that has been discovered is that they form less connections within the company than full-time office workers, which is understandable, right? So you want them to form more connections across the company and virtual mentors from outside the team help them do so. Virtual innovation. You want to practice virtual brainstorming. This is one of the biggest challenges that leaders tell me that they, oh, we don't want to go, we want to go back to the office full-time because otherwise, how do we innovate? Well, you know what? The in-person brainstorming has been shown to have a lot of problems, especially for introverts and people who are pessimistic, the people who don't generate ideas, the people who need to think through ideas, and the people who are uncomfortable make pushing their ideas on others, kind of introverts who prefer some more silent. Virtual brainstorming is a much more effective technique where you first brainstorm individually by yourself and then you share your ideas with others and then so you that addresses a lot of problems for opt for pessimists and for introverts and then after you share your ideas with others you comment on them asynchronously again and then you share revised ideas with others and then you have a discussion after that for evaluation of ideas much more effective what about serendipitous ideas you know, I've had a lot of leaders tell me, well, we need to go back to the office full time. Otherwise, we don't have any of these serendipitous ideas that result from hallway conversations. No, that's wrong. What you need to do is set up a channel for brainstorming for, I'm sorry, channel for serendipity, one for your team, one for your business unit, one for your company as a whole. And for each of those, you can, anyone can share ideas into that channel, relevant to the team, relevant to the business unit, relative, relevant to the company. And then other people, of course, are observing those channels. And this is within Microsoft Teams, Slack, Cards and Trello, if you're using Trello. And then you comment on it if you think the idea is good. And then other people comment and they, they get kind of a, the, goes to rolling into the snowball, goes into an avalanche. And then at that point, you can go into intentional brainstorming. That's a much more effective strategy that's adapted for the virtual format and addresses the hallway conversations issue. And finally, address DEI concerns. I mentioned about DEI issues before. There are some digital discrimination issues that do still occur in digital formats. And so DEI training needs to be adapted for the modern world. With all of this, what do you think of adapting your culture to align with a more hybrid remote work style? Would that be helpful for you? Please go ahead and vote. Let's see most people participated. Let's give you five more seconds.
we see that this is definitely very popular. So adapting your culture over essentially 95% of you, nearly 95% of you would want that to happen. Great, good to see that. And that's again, something to bring to your leaders and tell them about this issue. And if you're a leader yourself, of course, something you can adapt immediately. So let's see, oh, for digital discrimination, I mentioned the interruptions and privileges, another issue that I want to mention that people tend to interrupt those in minority positions and women much more. So this is something to address definitely. And finally, you want to provide training. People are not used to hybrid formats. And this is going to be many people are going to have these hybrid schedules. People aren't that used to virtual formats. They don't have training on this, but especially for hybrid formats, you want to share, share with them how to do effective hybrid work, what to do at home, what to do, focus on the office. You know, they'll have much less time in the office. They'll have maybe one day a week in the office. It's kind of gonna be the average, the default. So one day a week in the office, you need to really prepare for it in a way that's different than you would for any day that you come and have a team meeting. You want, so you want to prepare for your collaborative activities in the office. You want to prepare well and do your individual activities at home. And that needs to be something that people are trained on. People also need to be trained on effective virtual communication collaboration. We saw from the surveys that over 60% of the of uh, survey participants cite poor virtual communication collaboration skills as real serious problematic issues. And I'm shocked by how few companies are actually training people on effective virtual communication, virtual collaboration. You know, before the pandemic, companies spent tons of money on training their employees on communication, on training their employees on teamwork and collaboration. Effective virtual communication is very different than in-person communication. Effective virtual collaboration is very different than in-person collaboration, in-person teamwork. It's shocking how few companies are actually training people on this. And it will be so much better if people are trained on these issues. I'm curious about your thoughts on training. Do you think it would be helpful for you or your team members to benefit from professional development on improving effectiveness of these of hybrid work, virtual communication, virtual collaboration? Do you think that might be helpful? See the most participated, let's give you five more seconds. Well, this definitely seems to be the most popular. So professional development, and of course, you all are getting professional development in these issues right now. And this is something that would be very relevant and very important. I'd be happy to give professional development for any of your companies on effective hybrid work, effective virtual communication, effective virtual collaboration. This is definitely a very important issue. Good. Now, key takeaways for you to be thinking about. Most workers want a hybrid schedule, although on this, we could see from this presentation that most people in this presentation just a little bit more want remote work than hybrid schedule. But from external surveys, most workers want hybrid schedule, My large minority fully remote and are willing to quit if they don't get their desired work arrangement. So the over half are willing to quit. Cognitive biases, which we talked about, really create a big, big problem for wise decision-making and risk management and returning to the office, especially in the context of the Delta surge and other variants that are coming up behind Delta. Office return best practice, we know that. We've talked about this team-led hybrid first model with STEM staff who should be fully remote, 10 to 30% on average. And you need to adapt your culture if you want to seize competitive advantage in the future of work. So these are the key takeaways that you want to be thinking about as you're coming away from this presentation. Now, I mentioned I'll share free additional resources with a lot of this, with the, all the citations that are the basis for this presentation in the book, my best selling book called Return to Office Benchmarking to Best Practices for Competitive Advantage. And I'll also be happy to give you free of you coaching sessions. I have free coaching sessions available. They'll be for the first three claimants. And the way you'll claim them is after you get an email with the resources, there'll be a link for a coaching session which you can click on. And if the link is available, then you still have that coaching session available. We'll do the same thing with the polling. So please go ahead and vote on that. And in the meantime, while you're voting, I'll be happy to take any of your questions.
You can use the chat feature or the Q&A feature, whatever is more comfortable for you for the questions. Dr. Glob, I have a question for you. So sure. you mentioned uh, one of the things is uh, that, that's that's very imperative or, or uh, a huge influence in decisions is the, is the cognitive uh, biases that exist. Yep. What is your suggestion in in um, in approaching those or trying to address those? Uh, you know, if those exist, I know part of it is the culture of an organization, but uh, what are your suggestions in terms of you know the correct approach for for under those circumstances? The first thing is awareness. People need to be aware of these cognitive biases. They're just not aware of them. They feel what happens with managers, the status quo bias, right? What happens with leaders who want to go back full-time to the office is they, they feel this is the right thing to do. They just have this feeling. They feel this, this is the right thing to do. This is the right way to work. And therefore, we need to go back to the office. Now, that just doesn't make logical rational sense because you can do we can do all sorts of collaboration you you were working fine for all the pandemic right you you were working fine you were doing things effectively i mean of course people were screwing up some stuff when they were trying to do traditional brainstorming you know in virtual formats which doesn't work zoom happy hours doesn't work all of that stuff but clearly you can make it work and leaders are just not aware that these feelings are lying to them. Their gut intuition is lying to them. They're told to trust their gut. They're told to do what's comfortable for them. And they're making these fundamental mistakes. And the normalcy bias is another one. I mean, Apple, right? We're talking about Apple. Made trillion dollar company, one of the biggest, if not the biggest at this point in the world. When it was trying to, again, make its workers go back to the office, had significant rebellion. It was saying, okay, we're going to go back to the office in September, September, September. So Delta variant comes along in June, starts becoming more and more extensive, becomes bigger, bigger problem. So Apple decides in July 24th, when cases are shooting up, Florida has the largest case count it has ever had throughout the pandemic. And when or when our models are indicating that Delta will peak sometime in mid late fall, that instead of going back to the office in September, they'll go back to the office in October, <laughs> which is the height when it's supposed to peak for the Delta variant, right? Kind of ridiculous, silly, not smart, but that is exactly what's happening. They don't realize this normal bias is impacting them. So you need to educate people about these cognitive biases. That's the first step. And then the next step would be to set up some defaults that would automatically address some of these leaders who are kind of like, well, I don't have the status quo bias. <laughs> this is not a problem for me. And that's why I suggest a strong default of having no more than one day in the office unless leaders can justify it through extensive, through need for collaboration, for specific collaborative activities. So you set up some defaults, you set up some boundaries that help address these cognitive biases. So that would be my response to that. See something came into the chat. Uh, so Jason asked the tool I used to create the presentation. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's called Prezi Video. So if you Google Prezi Video, it will come up and that, that's, that's a tool. It's very helpful. Other questions? Yes, Dr. Gleb, I, I noticed that um, with a lot of these uh, recommendations, the ability to adapt uh, quickly and 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 uh, make changes that are that are non-trivial uh, is is really critical. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I recognize you know in my own team, in my own practice, in my own cognitive biases uh, that how how challenging this can be. Mm -hmm. So as as far as um, staying um, a little more agile and a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you noticed that really helps teams be able to make these kinds of adjustments more quickly? What really helps them is remembering that they're having sort of an experimental approach. We're kind of having this approach, we're going to experiment with it, and we're going to change it as needed, which is why companies that I helped work with, that I worked with, they set up, I mean, I, I was working with companies and transitioning back to the office starting in March. And so when it was clear that vaccines were going to be widely available and they had certain policies that in place, you know, the, I think of those companies of the 16 companies that I worked with, 15 of them decided on the hybrid first model with some fully remote options. One of them decided to be fully remote. Now, all of those companies were able to very quickly transition back to fully remote when the Delta variant, well, not all of them, I think three of them still have some people who are 
coming into the office occasionally, but the, they transitioned the large majority of their workers, large majority of them transitioned the large majority of their workers to full-time remote after it became clear that Delta was going to be a very, very serious problem. <laughs> and so because they had this specific flexibility, they didn't say, okay, this is one and done. We're saying this is our policy for all the time going forward into eternity. This is kind of, this is the policy that we developed that makes sense at this point in the cases, that makes sense at this point in the pandemic. We'll see how it works and then we'll change it as needed. So having that sort of more experimental approach rather than kind of one and done is very helpful. That definitely makes a lot of sense. And we're certainly attempting to also take these types of lessons uh, and incorporate them into our chapter planning as well. Good idea. And uh, that way we can uh, you know, meet the members needs in the way that is that's most valuable and most effective. And you know, hearing these, these comments about the uh, quarterly retreats and, uh, and that sort of thing makes me uh, happy to, to know that we uh, have our director of membership right now, Mehmet, is, is actually looking into a, a social event in September for ISACA members uh, here in South Florida to, to go ahead and, and gather those who are comfortable gathering in a, in a physical space together and, uh, and, and experiencing some time together, you know, of course, observing reasonable precautions, et cetera. So yeah. uh, definitely- yeah, if, you can do that, if you can do that in an outside space, that's definitely helpful. So that's something to be thinking about. Uh, late September in Florida should be not, should be fine for getting together outside. Shouldn't be too hot already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex exactly. We're trying to be be mindful of that. And I, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was looking at outside uh, events. So yeah, wonderful. So I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Lots more to consider. Uh, never really e even experimented with virtual or digital co working that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful things. Thank you for all these uh, food for thought recommendations the offer for resources and coaching as well, which uh, we'll be definitely looking into these resources and, and enjoying them and, and taking them to heart. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us for this presentation. Uh, thanks, Ryan Barras, for helping us put it together. Uh, thank you, as always, Dr. Gleb, for a very engaging, very informative research and data-driven uh, presentation. So uh, I have a great week, everyone. Have a great week, Dr. Gleb, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.